we have it set so you're all automatically muted, just in case you guys are a bunch of blabbermouths, but you can unmute yourself if you want. Let me shoot Fern a quick message. Oh, there he is. I don't have to. I'm back. All right. There he is. The legend. D1 athlete. See, he looked up. He knew who we were talking about. Oh, he can't hear me. There he is. Fern, we were just saying nice things about you. I doubt it. I doubt it very much, though. <laughs> so, this is uh, very fun. Just finished my workout, hence the uh, headband. I told you I was going to work out, Fern. How did you, did you hit your score on the Peloton? <laughs> I did PR on the Peloton. And then I took one of uh, Kalipa's classes. It was good. Uh, virtual cool. class from NC Fit? Yeah, I beat Kalipa. No big deal, you know. Just being a games athlete. Lighter, lighter weight. Lighter weight. So, you drinking tea, Fern? Like a... Uh, no. <laughs> no, drinking a <laughs> Moscow Mule. I drink okay, a lot. Really? Yeah, I drink a lot these days. So I suppose you can oh, drink man. and coach now these oh, days. Man, Brian's got some. I got some wine there, so I figure like we might as well. Who's drinking over in there? Brian's drinking. Brian. He's got a fancy glass. <laughs> Look at him stemming off. All right, I believe, but correct me if I'm wrong. Who was actually? I don't even have a beginning to that. Who was I emailing back and forth with? That was me. It's Jan here and Jack. Okay, so cool. Jack and I are the two owners here at CrossFit Liberate. Well, thanks. Is it Yanni or Jan? Uh, so Yanni is what some of my, my colleagues here call me, but my name is Jan. Uh, you can call me Jan. You can call me Johan. I've been called so many things in my life. It doesn't even matter anymore. I respond what is, to What's your preference? Uh, well, my actual name is Jan, so let's go with that. All right, Jan. Jan it is. <laughs> <laughs> what is that, Swedish, Sweden? Uh, it's Czech. I was born Czech? in the Czech Republic. Yeah. Cool. And then you, so you and Jack own CrossFit Liberate in Georgia? Athens, okay. Georgia, yep. So what's the deal? You guys opening on Monday? Yes. We are, op we are opening on Monday. Yeah, Jack, you want to tell them? Yeah, so interestingly enough, I had some time and listened to your most recent podcast about reopening today, so that was that was timely. Um, but the state of Georgia is starting to open some things up. Gyms are one of them in phase one. So we can't run group classes. That's one of the things that are prohibited in the reopening, but we are going to open up and do open gym times. So basically, you'll sign up just like you would for a normal class. There'll be six people in an open gym slot. We just basically can't lead the class, if you will. So that's how we're, we're having to operate coming back. Um, I know like for where, where in Athens, Georgia are you guys? I'm, I, I used to live there. That's what I'm asking. Oh, wow. So we're near the classic center, basically right next to the classic center. Oh, down. Yeah, yeah. I may or may not have spent the night in the Athens cardio count jail, but, um, <laughs> The, uh, yeah, I was there for like nine months. <laughs> there you go. In jail or in, in jail for nine months? Yeah, I was going to say. No, well, no, no, that was just overnight, but I lived there for nine months. Probably <laughs> should have been in jail. It would probably have been better if I was in jail for nine months. Um, well, so yeah, this, that's where things are. Um, yeah, it's, it's been crazy. So, our, so on, this, on, this, on that note, Jack, I saw there was a, some weird equation that gave like how many people you could have in your facility that was guidance, which basically came out to one person per thousand. Square. Is that accurate? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that specifically. We've just basically taken the CDC guideline of having, trying to have okay. no more than 10 people. And so we are opening up with six people in an open gym slot, hour and 15 minute open gym slots, and then 15 minutes in between. Okay. So I, I like, I listened to the podcast today. We did an equipment rental. So we rented out all the equipment in the gym. So we have a 5,000 square foot facility roughly. You know, we have a couple of barbells and some weights and stuff like that just for a couple of coaches to get things done. So, you know, we, the way we treated it was we put out a poll to the membership basically saying if you've rented equipment 
would you be willing to return that equipment in order for open gym hours? And we estimated that we needed somewhere around 30% of the equipment returned to have those six people classes. Um, so we got 60, about two thirds said that they would do that. But the rentals, what really kept us going through this, I mean, you were able to get equipment if you didn't put your membership on hold. Um, we put it, we put together four different packages of equipment, rented it all out on a Google doc and a poll in 17 minutes. And then we delivered it all within two days. So That's awesome. you know, we're going to go pick it, pick up the ones that want to return on Saturday. Were you guys uh, able to re retain? It sounds like you're able to retain most of your members. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, I, we, when we started this, we were at 285 members and we're at 264. Now, a lot of those oh, yeah, okay. members are on hold. So there's 45%, I think. Yeah, there's 120 members or so on hold out of our 264 total. So you retained them, but you didn't retain the revenue. Right, that's correct. Yeah, so okay, got it, okay. Are, some of them are students who won't be back until August, you know, being with we're, we're the University yeah. of Georgia. So, yeah. You know, we're hoping to play both sides of this and say somebody like uh, Ackerman who doesn't want to come back to the gym right away, right? And That's say, me. okay, you can, hiding. You, can, you can keep your equipment. That's fine because that's revenue, right? Yeah. So Amen. somebody that wants to return to the gym can return the equipment and there's, uh, there's revenue through that. So you want to support both sides of the people who do want to return to the gym and the people that aren't quite ready yet. And that's either one's fine. $160, $170 from one source is no different from another. What's your yeah. expectation? Have you guys, um, go ahead, go ahead, Jeff. How, what, what do you think? How many do you think will come back on Monday? Well, we, when we sent out the poll, we got, how many equipment packages do we have out, Jan? I would say somewhere in the like 72 to 73 range. So yeah. We got, I think 71 responses back. Yeah. So 40, when, when I saw it was 46 yes and 23 no's. So I think that there will be a, I think that's probably somewhat indicative of the way the membership feels about returning to the gym. Yeah, it's probably about 60, 40, like 60% ready to come back, 40% not. I don't know, just gonna try to um, either entice people or keep people on, but have you guys seen what O2, Bear Complex, and uh, a couple of these other companies are doing to help retention? No, tell me a little bit. So they, I don't know if you saw, we put it out. So I had Dave uh, Kalina from O2 on the podcast and them, they, along with Bear Complex, were doing a 50% revenue share with gyms that were in the coalition. Like basically just meaning you had a code on their website. <clears throat> um, and the reality is like, it was well-meaning and Dave fully admits this, but like people are getting a check for like a hundred bucks. It's like, okay, I get it. And it's, it's well-intentioned, but um after they had a call with Jason Kalipa and he kind of expressed a little bit more, he's like, Hey, that's cool that you guys are driving revenue. Well, we're trying to maximize at this point is retention. Like we, like we're not getting any new members and, and, and no matter how many cases of O2 or whatever you sell is going to help me keep the doors open. So what they put together, and this is live right now. So if you're not doing it, just slip in there and get a code because they'll honor it. What they're going to do is they're going to give, and this is some bonkers type stuff that they're, doing they're going to give every single member who keeps their membership intact through the month of may a hundred dollar gift card so if you had a hundred and to 50 to 200 members who kept their membership intact they're going to get with you and they're just going to give you the codes so you get to distribute them but like go on their website, reach out to them and like get that set up. It's just, it's, it's, it's one more way to like try to get, like keep people on board. Um, so they estimated that if they have 2,400 gyms that are participating in the coalition now, if all of them like participated and kept all of the members that they currently had, they'd be giving away something to the tune of $20 million in gift certificates. So it's a hundred bucks. So, I mean, like, 
dig into that and push that out. And I would just beat your members over the head with it. Like anything at this point, that's what I'm going to do. Anything at this point helps. So, and yeah. we, and we're, we're similar. We, we've been very fortunate. We're like, we've probably kept recurring revenue, like about 95%. We've wow. lost like 10, awesome. we've lost like 10 people in this, in this time frame. Now I would never claim that it's because we did something super. I, I literally don't fucking know. Like, I don't know. I just like, we're, we're lucky, I guess. Um, but this is something that will help. So I, cause right about now, I, cause you guys have been closed for like a little over a month. Is that correct? Yeah. We're right at coming up on 45 days, John. Yeah. So you're about it'll be 45 days on May 4th when we reopen. Yeah. So you guys are at the same, which is right where people are just like lose that kind of benevolent feeling. They're like, all right, I support you, but I'm not getting <laughs> what I need out of this. Um, so throw it out there, dude, get it out there. And then, and what's cool is they give you the gift certificate. So you actually get to give those people the hundred dollars. Yeah. So, okay. And, and it's that, and it's, uh, it's four companies are doing it. So it's Peori, which used to be uh, pure pharma, um, bear complex, O2 and born primitive. Yeah. We actually got a little kickback from born primitive. Uh, I think it was like about 50 bucks through that program that you described. Yeah, I got like a hundred something bucks and I was like, just give it a red cross, man. Like, I don't, I don't need it. Like, right. Um, <clears throat> we took it. <laughs> Listen, I'm not, mad, I'm not mad at anybody that took anything. I'm like, you should take everything you can at this point. But I was just like, just give it to somebody that's fine. Um, but so, that's cool because you get the, you get the members. So. so do you guys want to dig into why we're here today a little bit? Yeah. I, yeah. Before so, we um, are, sorry, I, I want to give a special um thank you to brandon moreno i call him dr moreno uh he is the one that really turned us on to your podcast um he him and brian clap so yeah, brian introduced me and then after that it was like crack <laughs> yeah so brandon i think brandon's probably listened to maybe every single one of your episodes he's he's really secretly like in shock right now that you're doing this He's so excited. I think but, I think he might appear. You guys pants, know? But. You guys know Dr. Jenkins because he's a professor. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He coached for us for a little bit. Oh yeah, he's a good dude. Yeah, he is. Oh yeah, yeah. We know him well. Um, so yeah. Anyway, uh, special thanks to Brandon, and then special thanks to Brian as well. Yeah, and so on that note, you know, one of our coaches development program going. Um, and that was really something that Brandon kind of really pushed us into, um, into getting started. And so we, the first activity we did is we all listened to the, the uh, episode on the whiteboard brief and then discussed it, sort of had an activity around that. And then we, uh, the next week filmed ourselves doing a whiteboard brief and then watched it, watched them all as a group, uh, and filled out some feedback forms. And then, um, you know, I just got a wild, wild hair and I decided to email y'all and see if you'd be willing to discuss the subject of stimulus because in kind of, in, in some of our whiteboard briefs, I felt like the, the issue that was most prevalent was this idea of what is the stimulus, how do I describe it, and how do I make sure that people hit it? And so that's why, that's why you guys are here today. So we've all, by the way, listened to episode four on scaling in preparation for today. Wait, Jay, you got, you want to take this, or how do you want to how do you want to work it? Yeah, I mean, we're happy to talk about it, and this is probably one of my favorite things to discuss, as far as yeah. CrossFit goes. Just helping people understand that a the athletes, but also most importantly, you guys as the coaches that are going to then explain it to the athletes. So we're I mean, episode four seems like forever ago. I don't <laughs> remember. I, I wouldn't have known that that's what we spoke about. But what? Where do you want to begin, Yanni? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think I think we all have a different way of dis, of defining the stimulus. I'd love to hear y'all's definition of of what that word means and how to best describe that to athletes. <laughs> Ooh, that's a good way to ask. I'll, so let's. We've. Ne I've never given a definition of that. For, so let me let me take a stab at it. I try not to use. <laughs> let's see how many times I use the word stimulus in the definition of stimulus. Yeah. Um, so in in approaching a workout, I would I would tell your athletes 
you know, every, every, every workout should yield a certain response and should allow you to achieve a certain, whether it's score or, you know, feeling perceived exertion. And, and it's going to be how we, how we explain that to the athletes so they can best achieve that. You know, and obviously that's how you would say, well, that's the stimulus of the workout. Then of course we have to look at every workout and either by a doing it first or B just, thinking about it and I'm sure all of you as coaches the, the longer you do it I'm sure you've realized okay I can kind of look at the whiteboard and understand what a good score would be or what I should t tell my athletes to use for load and then of course figuring that out for each person so you know like I said quite simply just what you should get out of this workout decent Fern yeah, I would have made it much shorter, but that's because I'm dumb. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so you, you, it's a great answer and you got to it. And like the, the simplest way I could put it is like the stimulus is, this is what's supposed to happen, right? And the beauty about keeping it super simple like that is it's, it's implied that what's supposed to happen is unique to everybody, right? So it, this is what is supposed to happen. Now, however, we have to scale that in order to make this happen, everybody's on the same page. For instance, if I was going to make it a task for any workout, meaning it's a 2159 or something like that, be like, Hey guys, this is supposed to be a four to eight minute workout, right? So right out of the gate, I've painted a picture of what is supposed to happen. Right. And then you can start to elaborate on a little bit more potentially on how much you want to get into the weeds on are the reps supposed to be unbroken? Should it be no more than X number of sets to get to, you know, like for me personally, anything that involves a 21, 15, nine, I generally gravitate to be like, it, you must be able to get to 21 in no more than three sets. Because if it's a 21, 15, nine, it's typically pretty fast. I mean, we've all done one of those. So I really trying to outline what is supposed to happen in this workout understanding that that's different for everybody we might have to make some changes there but that's the stimulus is like what is about to unfold is, is really what i want to do now the the trick there is you need to know that right like you need to know that beforehand you need to know that that's what it was designed for because the worst thing you can do not the worst thing but if what i give out and then what unfolds doesn't match that's a problem right now I've started to lose a little bit of equity with the members who's like, that didn't, that's not what you said was supposed to happen. Right. So in some instances, like when I say this is supposed to happen now, what I need to make sure is that that actually happens. And this is where the scaling aspect comes in is that like what I say now needs to unfold real time. So, um, does anybody have questions on that? Like about anything or anything specific? Uh, how often do you get into like, you know, things like, oh, this is a grippy workout, or this one's going to blow up your quads, or, you know, this is going to blow up your shoulders, things like that. Um, I think, I'll try to give this like a broad brush, but I think you get into it as much as it has value. And I know that seems like a weird non-answer, but like, if it doesn't really have any value, then don't get into it. However, there are a lot of instances where you're going to shed light on something that they would not have picked up on simply by reading the workout. So I think it's super valuable. If it happens to be grippy because it's a toes to bar row and then, I don't know, farmer's carry, people don't necessarily translate that into grippy. They just read, I'm, on, I'm hanging on the pull-up bar doing toes to bar. They're thinking midline, not necessarily grip. And on the rower, they're thinking my legs hurt. And on the farmer's carry, they're thinking grip. But you need to let them know that, like, listen, on the toes to bar and round five, because you've been doing this for 20 minutes, you might need to break those up or you might need to start breaking them up. So I think as long as it adds value, you can throw it in there. Uh, I'm a big fan of, like, throwing the, sprinkling those little nuggets in there. I think uh, what, can be, what can have tremendous value in order to get people into that right stimulus so that what you say is supposed to happen, happen actually does happen is there are some tricky workouts where they're written. People won't look at total volume. 
So mm-hmm. sometimes you need to have done the math beforehand, right? So uh, Brittany, Brittany was happy with that, right? So if, if you, if it's, if let's like, say it's five rounds of 2020, right? Like all they're reading is 20 reps. You need to sometimes point out the fact and be like, guys, that's a hundred pull-ups. So if that seems like a lot to you, we need to make an adjustment here. Like if you've never done a hundred pull-ups, maybe today's not your day. So sometimes we have to pull back the curtain on things like that, because you'll see this in the class. When you say that, like somebody, one of those knuckleheads has been here like five years. You'd be like, Oh, that is a hundred. Like just doing basic math. They're like, Oh, I didn't even think about that. So that's where I think that stuff can be super valuable, which will prevent people from making poor decisions on scaling, therefore missing the stimulus. Yeah, we should have done that earlier this week when Reagan accidentally ended up doing almost 200 GHD sit-ups. Yeah, that's a perfect example. Uh, that, that, that actually did happen. That was an example that was used in the podcast, too. I know, and Reagan actually did it. Yeah. Were you sore, Reagan? Uh, I was past sore. I really did think I'd injured myself. <laughs> you probably had rhabdo. That's, no, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good definition for rhabdo right there. Maybe for like two days. You yeah. what? I couldn't stand up straight for like two days. Oh, good. That's, that's definitely like a mild case of rhabdo. Yeah. Like, as long all, as you didn't see Coca-Cola, we're fine, right? Yeah, we've yeah. all done that though on the GHG. We've all been there. We've all been there. I, I'd say, you know, in piggybacking off what Fern said, part of that goes to making sure they hit the stimulus. So, you know, you have a grippy workout, like, like Fern is saying, you know, say it's a, like, what was that open workout we did? 18-1, Fern? 18-1, the uh, dumbbell clean and jerk row. And toes, toes to bar, bar, right? Yeah, so yeah. it's grippy. Yeah. So yeah. you're like, okay, I forget what we got, you know, but say 20 minute AMRAP, we got like 12. I beat, I beat you, whatever it was. I beat it, was you. it was close. It was like 10 to 12 rounds was a good score there, right? Right. So you yeah. might say yeah, like, yeah. Hey, a good score is 10 to 12. Here's how you get there. You can do seven or 10 or whatever the toes to bar are unbroken, but because we're going to the row, because we're going to hang on to this dumbbell, perhaps you want to think about breaking early, you know? And, and so like mm-hmm. that might okay. be a workout or even something that people don't think about. Like we all, because we do CrossFit, I think forget, the average person, even your five-year member, like Fern gave an example, doesn't always think like a workout like DT. If you don't tell your members, hey, after your 11th rep, that's where you rest because you have to pick it up at 12th time anyway. You know, so you're like, hey, I want you to go. These are rounds where you should be able to go and broken. D- uh, DT is a five to seven minute workout, but here's how you get there. You know, after your 11th deadlift, you shake out your grip. You know, after your ninth or your eighth clean, you put it down before you go to the overheads. So those are all kind of tricks of the trade to get them to hit the stimulus. Otherwise, you know, and also you're going to have that person, like we can all potentially go unbroken on one round of DT and then lay on the ground before we start the second round. So we have to explain, hey, you know, kind of uh, something I've always tried to explain and maybe I don't do it well is like in order to hit the stimulus, a lot of times you have to slow down. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's a really, really, really good point. And I don't think I figured I've been doing CrossFit eight years and I don't think I figured that out until the past <laughs> couple of years. Seriously. Well, it's like, that goes out like a rocket. Every yeah. Time. And that's not always and, the best. But then, you know, and there's, there's a lot to be gained by that. You know, once you've been doing it long enough, like I would encourage you do a 20 minute AMRAP, but treat those first two minutes like it was a two minute workout and see what happens for 18 minutes. But I think for so many people, it's like, like Fern said, if you can't do 21 reps of Fran unbroken, you probably shouldn't be doing 95, but we might let you break it to three so you can still do it in under five minutes. Like we can all gut out 21 reps of, a, of any given workout, but then be smashed. So sometimes the, and it's, it's kind of the same uh, for, and I don't know if you've ever spoken about this at the level one, it's like butterfly pull-ups and regular pull-ups. Like at some point, strict pull-ups are more efficient than butterfly because I can't do butterfly anymore. So I like, this is the most efficient my body could be right now. So you have to mm-hmm. just kind of explain it to them there. What, uh, do you guys have a, um, a workout program for today? Like, are you guys doing Zoom classes and stuff? 
Uh, we, so we, we use actually this kind of brings up my next point and, and, um, I don't mean to derail anything, but, um, one of the things that I think always comes up for us is the subject of time management with respect to making sure everyone does hit that stimulus. So we use CompTrain and we use their okay. class program okay. and they provide, they provide a really nice kind of comprehensive coaches notes package, which includes timestamps for everything and teaching points and uh, a thorough warm up. Um, and I think sometimes what happens for us is if you, if you try to follow that to the T, you know, you end up three minutes before the workout starts and you've got, you know, half the class is still trying to get their box for box pull-ups or, you know, they're still deciding what weight to put on the bar and then you don't have time for a bathroom break. And then next thing you know, your class is five minutes long and, and you've got a class on the hour. So, you know, so I, I think there's, there's the elephant in the room for us, which is time management and then how you layer something like time management against making sure everyone scales appropriately to hit the stimulus. Yeah. I also, uh, so that was brought up by coach Ashley Patel. So I'm just, do you mind real quick, Jan, if she explains her question? Cause she sent her back a really good question and wanted to ask yeah. y'all today. So go Ashley. Hold on. You're putting me on the spot, Jack. <laughs> It was a really good question. These are, it's a really, I think it's a really good question for Jason and Jason. Okay, I texted this to Brandon and I said, I've nailed down checking in with everyone during the class to see what they're thinking of scaling to because Sonia suggested that, but I have trouble having enough time to really make sure that they're picking movements that'll actually help them progress to like real toaster bar or real pull ups. Um, and then I think in our movement prep, we touch on like every single movement we're going to do in the workout. And so I think we could spend our time more effectively, maybe like on our practice round and then finding better scales so that we have time for a bathroom break and stuff too. I think this is a good, like your bus stop type analogy, Fern. Yeah. So um, I, I think it's worth noting just so we're on the same page. Um, Lesson plans don't make you a good coach. I don't care who wrote the lesson plan. Not me, not anybody, right? So it's, it's, it's a tool. And like any tool, my ability to use the tool is what makes me effective, right? And understanding where my skill set is relative to that tool is super important. Um, and what I mean by that is I can have a perfectly delineated lesson plan and still run an awful class. Like that is, that is absolutely thing. That, and dude. I would, yeah. And I would also go so far as to say, you could have a lesson plan that you hit all of the marks, the time checks and run an awful class. I've seen it. I've done it. Um, so I think it, it is worth noting that it's not about the lesson plan. It's actually about what unfolds real time. Now let's talk about like, I think more to your question, Ashley, it, when you're struggling with that, this is where I think when it comes with experiences, when I'm looking at my lesson plan, if I'm going to be honest with myself, what's important? So let me ask you this. Like, what's the most important thing in the class, Ashley, that you're facilitating? Like, forget the lesson plan. Like, what is, what is important to you that happens in that class? Mm, probably just making sure that everyone has a good time during their workout no one gets hurt. I would agree. Right. So let's make it super simple. Everybody has a good time. Nobody gets hurt. They do some fitness. Check those three boxes. You've probably run a pretty good class. So when you're looking at that lesson plan, if, if, if what is on paper is not doable, I think a smart coach doesn't do the lesson plan as written, right? There's some, there might be some things in there like I don't have the skill set or for whatever. I'm not organized enough to make this happen. What can I take out of here that isn't necessarily going to degrade the, the experience of the class, right? Now, I'm not suggesting you take things out, but sometimes you do have to make that decision. Be like, I don't have time to do that. And what's important? What's important is I teach them and I give them the appropriate amount of time to scale. And then what I should be doing as I'm doing that is like, I'm still pushing to get it all in, right? So you're not cutting it out just because like, oh, I can't get it in and you never try to hit the mark again. So I, I do want to express that. Now with the bus stops, you want to plan out if I'm trying to give, make sure that 
athletes have the appropriate scale, I'm going to start my teaching progressions at the lowest level and work through them so that everybody gets a touch point and everybody gets practice where they're at. And what I'll do is I'll leave them at their each, at each one of their particular bus stops. What you need to manage, and this is something I learned from Joe Alexander, who's a flow master, is like your ability to compress and expand content based on the time allotted is what really defines all of us as professionals. Do I have five minutes to teach the thruster or do I have 15 minutes to teach the thruster? And can I fill both time slots appropriately? So you may have to run through the bus stops really quickly, but it's more important that you actually make sure that we get those bus stops for everybody than just saying, okay, screw it. Everybody's doing whatever. Um, I don't know. I'm making this up on the spot. Everybody's doing jumping pull-ups rather than starting with something like a bent over row with a barbell, because we might have that and then maybe have ring rows set up and then something like negative pull-ups and then a pull-up progression or something like that. So um, I uh, think I like it's worth workout. Yeah. And, um, and just to add to what Fern is saying, I think I, I like what you said, Fern. It's like you have to be able to, so for example, on, on this beep test, you have to be able to teach the thruster in five minutes for a class like this. If there's, you know, ob obviously this is the only workout, there's probably more to it than just this, right? For your given day. Uh, on this particular day, I'm actually, I was trying to find an example of a day that we had timestamps in the coach's notes and everything like that. I don't see them in the notes for this particular one. Let me, Cause I mean that you have, with that workout, I mean, 20 rounds yeah, would be kind of back ridiculous, to, right? 20 so, rounds is bonkers. Like people getting past 10 is really good in that yeah. workout. Yeah. I mean, I think I got 20 ones for him, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was, I mean, I think I did, but I think I was doing sixes. It's a lot different. Like that one rep makes a big difference. Um, but like Fern said, we have to be able to coach the thruster for five minutes and for 15 minutes. And I don't see, I don't look at um, comp train often, but I, I do know there are days, whether it's comp train or NC or whatever, that they try to cram a lot in. I do believe if you were to look at it, it's probably doable, but it's up to you as the coach to realize, okay, this is not the day that everyone's going to learn everything I know about the thruster. This is the day where we're going to focus on quarter extremity and that's it. Or we're going to focus on every rep, touch it, you know, your weight stays in your heels. And that's where, you know, you, you can throw out something, you know, say you work on that quarter extremity piece, you have your beginners who are just like, hey, let's go slow and make sure you finish your hip extension before pressing. But then you have your faster athletes your more experienced athletes that you know you work on the opposite hey you cannot initiate your squat until you hit that, those buttons on your shoulders you know but you still have to get through that thruster fast and drop a little knowledge in there is that kind of like what you're so this, referring to fern uh correct yeah yeah i i think it's just a little self-awareness goes a long way in, in these things um here's what i think might be valuable does anybody want to give a wad brief for that workout right there? Ooh, pressure. Mm, How about uh, Brandon? Long haul. Brandon, take it away. Yeah. This is your moment, buddy. Uh-oh, Brandon, there's a lot of pressure on you. We're going to talk about you on the next podcast. So, <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> yeah, this, is, this is the moment you've been waiting for. This is like, Either use me you as know, a good example or a bad. I'll still be famous. It doesn't there's matter. A, um, so there's a band called The Who. Have you guys heard of The Who? Yeah. So classic rock, you know, 60s, 70s. There was a show where their drummer, Keith Moon, like was crazy on drugs and couldn't play. And they pulled somebody out of the audience to play drums for that set. This is your moment, Brandon. This is your The Who moment. So am I giving a, my briefs are probably the worst. Am I giving a brief on beep test or long haul? What do you think, Fern? Which one do you want? Which, uh, which one do you understand the better? Let me give you that. Um, beep test, because I've done it. You want me okay. to go? Let, so, me, let me pull so, up. Let so, yeah, pull, pull up. up the beep test, and that'll be the whiteboard. And then, Brandon, when you're ready, if you need a second, look at it. And then what you'll do is we'll, we'll, uh, we'll just let you give the full whiteboard brief. Imagine we're all in the class. So we'll do, like, a little real-time thing here. And Brandon, what's, uh, your, what's your heart rate right now? He's getting fit. He's 72. getting fit right now. 72. It's a correlate of fitness. Um, That's right. So. 
All right, here's your uh, here are your coach's notes. And for, just to be clear, uh, this is the only workout of the day for this particular day? I think that particular day, that's all we did. Probably. This is like his test, so it's probably yeah. meant to be. Yeah, it was definitely a testing day for sure. Hey, well, uh, while well, Brandon's like thinking about this, let me ask you, Jason. Um, Which how Jason? Either one. Um, we do a lot of instruction. How much instruction is too much instruction? I mean, given uh, it might be, this has got three movements. We Sometimes they generalize and have a theme for all of them. But I feel a lot of times we hit the same items almost repetitively. It's, um, this is gonna sound like a non-answer, but that depends on who's doing it, right? So if you've ever been around uh, people like Coach Bergner or Chris Henshaw, I mean, I've seen those guys talk for 35 minutes straight and nobody, missed a beat yeah. you know so some i think i think effective teaching again also has a little bit of self-awareness in it like if people's eyes are starting to roll back in their head and they're no longer paying attention I, it might be time to move on from that um so i mean you, you need to cover the bases but like it, and, and that depends on how much knowledge you have about it how much of a progression you have built into it um stuff like that. You know, for instance, I had uh, um, some people doing a CDP at my gym when the world was open. And uh, one of the guys was watching Cassidy, who's my head coach, coach a class. And I don't, it doesn't even matter what he was teaching. I forget what it was. And he was done teaching the portion. And I think he was teaching PVC pipe movement for something like 10 to 12 minutes. And when he was done, uh, the guy walked over and he was like, that felt like three minutes, but he's been teaching that movement for 12 right? So I think it depends on your ability to interact with people, how organized it is, what the flow is. Is it taught in a logical progression that makes sense, that gives you the ability to get a lot of reps in without being repetitive? So um, I, I know that seems like kind of a non-answer, but like it depends, right? Like how organized are you? How much thought did you put into it? And how efficiently can you execute on that plan? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would just think that most of us are, are part-time coaches for the most part. We're not subject of matter experts. Like, you know, uh, the old geezer and, and Henshaw either, but teaching minor issues just to teach them where I don't think there's a whole lot of comprehension because we're not subject matter experts is somewhat a waste of time. And well, were you, I, I were don't you, think you need to be a, go ahead. I was going to just say, when you, when you asked about teaching, did you mean specifically the whiteboard brief or did you mean throughout an hour class? Throughout, throughout an hour class, not the whiteboard brief, but you know, like you'll look at the, these coaches' notes and they'll have uh, Bergeron writes, basically, he'll, he'll write a thought for the day and tries to carry that through. And it's, it becomes a general theme for the day or the movement might be um, feet or hip yeah, here I can I'll scroll down here and you guys can see exactly what he's talking about. So, um, I just I don't, don't think at times the theme, the, but the, here, here are some examples of like the, the – teaching points that we're hitting on, right? I mean, sometimes they're really good, but sometimes, you know, we're speaking to it just because it says it, and we, I don't think the coaches have, have a full comprehension of what they're teaching. Yeah, so I, I prefer, like, this is all good stuff, and I, I wouldn't even, I haven't even read it, but I would probably agree with what Ben has written there, or Harry, whoever wrote it. Um, I prefer whatever I'm teaching, it's just got three bullet points in my mind. Those are the three bullet points that I'm going to hit. That's it. It, it doesn't matter. Like if I'm going to get any further into that, I probably have a, a pretty significant chunk of time to work. Um, it's also not realistic for, for most part-time coaches, like you said, to be able to regurgitate that paragraph because they have not allocated the time to dive into that and do all of that. So the expectation that I'm going to be Ben Bergeron or somebody else like that is unrealistic. But like what I could be is I could just be Brandon and hit these three, these three um, kind of like pieces that I want to highlight for each movement. And then I move on. And that way it's, it, it is me delivering the information, but I've got the three things that I want, you know, for like a thruster, I want to make sure I'm like, Hey, heels down in the squat. I want to make sure that the timing is right as I transfer from the thruster to the overhead position. And I want to make sure that the timing is right on the way down. If I can check those three boxes, I've got something that looks like a pretty good thruster, you know, so that's going to be my focal point as I work through 
the movement. So I like to keep things in threes. But typically, once you get past that, it gets real sloppy. But so, so um, can I, for um, Fern, I want to make sure I kind of hear you correctly because this is what I'm hearing. I don't know if that's the, but you're like okay, you've been given a roadmap by Contrain, right? Okay, so you've got a general outline of the way the class should go, and then you need to make that yours, so to say. Yeah. So, if you're driving yeah. down the road, hey, well, there's a pothole, right? So you're not just like, well, the map says go through the pothole no matter what, right? You're going to swerve around and you have it. You have an outline. It's an outline. It's, it's not gospel, right? Like, it's not like you have to do this and this thing. Because, again, it's only as good as my ability to facilitate it. And at the end of the day, nobody gives a shit. Like, you guys don't care. The members don't care if you hit that timeline or not. What they care about is, like, did I learn something? Did the coach interact with me and then try to improve my movement? And did I get a good workout in while simultaneously having a good time? That's it. That's all that matters. And I'm going to drip all that other information on them over a lifetime, hopefully, but like months, years, weeks, whatever that time frame is going to be. But yeah, you should take ownership of it to the best of your ability. That's, that's the goal. The goal is to take that information and then digest it and then deliver it. That's me because I'm not going to be, Ben Bergeron. I'm not going to be Chuck Carswell. I'm not going to be Jay Ackerman. I'm not going to be any of those people. I'm going to be me. So I'm going to deliver that information the best way I can deliver it. And, and I think one last piece would be just remember your members are there to exercise, not listen to you talk. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter how smart you are. They don't care. 80% of your members just want to get fitter, just want to exercise. Probably more. I think like sometimes, sorry, this is Brittany. Um, I think sometimes we forget that like 10% effort is still effort and that like all of our members don't need to have like perfectly executed max effort on every freaking wad and neither do we. Like as long as we're like making an effort and providing what's valuable for our members and like seeing them when they're in class and you know, like not worried about, like so worried about finishing on time that we like miss someone completely. And that really like has a negative impact on their entire experience at the gym. Like we've done our job. And I think more of it is like, yes, like following a guideline and yes, like then right programming or whoever in a certain way. Um, but like actually like caring about like what actually matters. Yeah. In the care, context care, care. of like, having like a guideline. <laughs> well, and I think they're gonna as your members come back next week that's going to be even more apparent to them. They're going to realize, hey, I only worked out for 20 minutes a day with a set of dumbbells, and I got healthy. I feel good. You know, your members should not be working out at 100. Like, this is a day maybe we'll hear what Brandon has to say. But, you know, that, <laughs> that maybe they should. But most of the time, you're right. They, they should not. All right, so let's do this, Brandon. We're going to give you – are you ready? Yeah, Jan, can you stop sharing screen? I like to see faces. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Right, as long as you have what you need, I, I don't care how you do it. Yeah. I'm going to make All it right, so I can only ready, see Brandon. Brandon. <laughs> All right. Anyways, you guys ready? go over three minutes, you're fired. I'm going seven minutes. <laughs> there you go. 90 seconds. All right. Welcome to CrossFit Liberate. Today we got a great workout planned. I've done it several times. Um, I find it exhilarating. Uh, we need to be able to do this workout called Benjron D Beep Test. And what it is, it's an EMOM, which is every minute on the minute. We're gonna do seven single dumbbell goblet thrusters, seven alternating single dumbbell power snatches, and seven burpees. So we need to be able to do seven, seven, and seven every minute as the minute as each minute goes by okay our goal today is to be able to do seven to ten rounds and if we're able to finish those ten rounds we're going to add one rep to each of those movements as each minute progresses past the 10 minute mark okay so let's talk about the seven dumbbell goblet thrusters this is something i want you guys to be able to pick up um, the weight and knock out 25 unbroken when fresh okay um, for the dumbbell power snatches, you know, something probably similar to that, but you need to be able to alternate arms. So let's say 10 each arm. And then for the burpees, 
I want to make sure that you're getting your chest and your thighs all the way to the ground and you're able to pop back up. What we are going to do is we're going to do a practice round. And that practice round is going to be exactly one minute. And when we get done with that practice round, I want you to look up at the clock and see how much time you have left. Depending on how much time you have left, that's how we know if we're going to scale movement or we're going to scale the movement, if we're going to scale the reps, um, or how we're going to approach the workout after we complete our practice round. Um, that's it. Cool. 144. Um, all right, so let's do this. I, I always think it's valuable, like, a, how do you think it went, Brandon? Like, nobody's going to be more critical than you. So, if, like, what do you think about the, the brief? Um, I love that tool because I ask athletes the same thing because I never really know what they're going to say. That's what so Pat Sherwood. That's the way to start it, and then, then you can jump off of that. So, um, <laughs> it was a little bit quick, uh, you know, put on the spot, but I felt as if 50% uh, of the crowd probably understood what I was talking about, and I was probably answering a few questions here and there. Um, yeah, it, it was, it was probably, I gave myself a C plus. Okay. All right. Uh, does any of the group, so you guys work with Brandon, obviously on a regular basis, like this, is obviously our first time meeting him. So I, I kind of would like to get a little bit of y'all's feedback and understand like, it's not a shot at Brandon, but be critical here. And because it's important if any of us are going to get better at anything that we be critical about it. So what do you, what do you like about it? And then what could be done better? So if somebody wants to chime in there, just kind of give me the, give me what you think. First glance, don't think about it too much. Just like right off the cuff. What do you think? You kind of moved around the movement standards. He was talking about uh, doing a practice round seven reps and it, then he went straight into burpees about hitting the, hitting the chest and popping right back. I didn't really talk about that in the thrusters or the alternating snatches, whether it was movement standards or what that feeling was. And what, what, what are you going to feel like after that minute of practice round? What's yeah, that, I would what's, say. What's your expectation framed on that? Yeah, I would say the same. I didn't – I know what the Bergeron beef test feels like, and it feels like absolute hell. So I felt like he could have explained, hey, this is fast and furious. I just said a little bit ex better explanation of the stimulus. A little definition on scoring would have been helpful too. Like, you know, what's a good, what's a good score or projected score, like six rounds, eight rounds, 10 rounds, that sort of thing would have been helpful. I think it, I think you approach the workout very differently. If you see that, that, you know, the best score of the day is like eight rounds and you're like, wow, okay, I'm probably only going to get about five here. And if you're only going to get about five, maybe you're going to push a little bit harder through those five rounds than you would if you knew that this was a longer workout. Anybody else got anything? Brandon, despite my feelings for you, I'm proud of you. That was good. You're a new coach, and that was uh, that was on the spot. So I'm, I'm happy that you. Can did I just that say I've only been coaching three months. I'm just yeah. going to say that that's not an excuse, but I've we're like still not months. we're still not friends. But I'm I'm proud of you. <laughs> Maybe Kelly would join me in the gym and actually do some squatting. Um, all right. So I thought all in all, like timeline was good. So it's a minute 44. Um, and this is something we preach at seminars, which is, you know, failure to execute the timeline is, you know, basically uh, a lack of, I forget what the term is, but it's just like failure to prepare. So going over or going under means that it's bad, right? And I'm not saying it was bad, right? I don't know how you guys felt. It felt a little choppy. Like I kind of know what the workout is, but I had a little problem following what it is that he was talking about. So I think if you zoomed out a little bit, Brandon, and I always like to think of it like this. People like stories, right? How do I make my whiteboard brief a story, right? So the first thing in any story is like, who are the characters, right? The characters is the workout. The workout is, here it is, blah, blah, blah. Just literally just talk through it. Like, don't even, like, and when I say talk through it, I mean, like, don't get to any detail, like, really whatsoever. Like, so if, we was, if I was going to walk through, uh, like, the, that one's a little bit different. I think the, the Bergeron beat test is, is an EMOM with seven thrusters, seven pull-ups, seven burpees right? Like the, the original beep test. That's literally how I would say it. All right, guys, every minute on the minute, we're going to go seven pull-ups, seven thrusters, seven burpees. That's what we're going to do. 
And we're going to hold that as long as we can until we can't do that anymore. That right there is about 15 seconds worth of words. But I think everybody's got a pretty good idea of like what is about to happen. Who are the characters in this story? Here's, the, here's, here, here's who they are. Here's how it's going to work out. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about like the, the story plot, right? Hey, guys, in this workout, the score that we're shooting for is something north of 10 rounds. Some of you might come up just a little bit short. Some of you might go a little bit over. 15 is crushing it. Okay. Then from there, I might, I might sprinkle on a little bit more of the stimulus, like how that would break up. But like typically, guys, what you want to be doing is like, I want to be done with whatever my scaling options are in 45 seconds on the long end. Right. And I think everybody's got a pretty good idea of where we're going at this point. And then I'm going to follow that up with some scaling options. So like if we need to scale the burpee, we're just going to do a kickback. That's an option for pull ups. If we've got them, I just want to I want to do pull ups. Maybe we bring the volume down to keep me in the 45 minute window for the thrusters. Manage the load. If we need if we have an injury or some sort, we maybe front squat, we maybe push press. But I typically like to keep it in that order because it allows me to, to tell the story. Right. Who are the characters? What's the plot, right? And then in there, it's just like, what is the structure of that and how does this all unfold, right? So it's just like, what's the workout? What's the stimulus? What are my scaling options? And you can do most workouts very, very simply if I just stick to that template. What's the workout? Here's what it is. And I, I typically recommend just like, just read the workout. If you put too much into it, 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 it really causes people to get lost, right? So like when I give mine, I don't talk about weights. I will literally say, guys, seven, 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 burpees, pull-ups, thrusters. We're going to hold that as long as we can until you can't hit it inside the 60 second window anymore. Right? I don't have to make it terribly complicated, but everybody's on board with what's happening right now. But all right, I got to do 21 reps in 60, in, in 60 seconds and I need to be able to do it in 45 seconds. So I'm going to have to scale this, uh, blah, blah, blah. What I want to do is start painting this picture that they color in themselves. Right. If you've done this really, really well, when you're done with the brief, they've already made a good decision in their mind because you've done the Jedi mind trick for them. Be like, guys, if you can't do 21 to 30 reps at the load that we've chosen here, then you're definitely not going to be able to do seven and hold it because you're going to get tired quick, fast, and in a hurry. This one hurts. I'm just going to tell you straight up, it hurts. It's going to start hurting at about round seven. That's where everything gets really serious. And then we're going to see how long you can hold on to that pain train as we go through, right? That's the stuff you sprinkle on at the end to really kind of start paint that picture of like, hey, I'm warning you, it's coming. Trust me. Okay. I, um, I like, I like so, that specifically for, that'd probably be the biggest uh, missing piece of just like, hey, this workout, the first two minutes, you shouldn't feel terrible. Like you're like, okay, I got this. But then all of a sudden, it's going to smack you in the face. And then it's like, how long can you sustain this? Um, I think everything Fern said. And then one last piece. And, and let's also keep in mind, it was a little confusing, but we're also not looking at a whiteboard behind you that has the movement. Yeah, you, know, yeah, you can't, harder to explain the scaling when you're not demonstrating the movements uh, in front of us. I think the one piece you could have layered on there would be like you mentioned, hey, you're going to do one round and look at the clock, but what's good? Well, I did it in 59 seconds. Cool, it's about to beep again. You know, your first three rounds should take you 30 to 35 seconds. Then they're going to start to get longer. The last few rounds, it's like you're just hanging on, and it's basically going to be three or four minutes of continuous movement till you miss. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. How often do I get um, critiqued by you guys? It's great. I'm gonna. I, I didn't. I thought you were gonna do the real beep test. I didn't even realize. I don't know if I looked at it wrong. Oh no, he he did a um, a home version that we had on the whiteboard today. Oh, okay, that's cool. Yeah, I was that was like, good. I, I was gonna, I was like, okay, I can no, do this. Good. I can do that tomorrow. Um, um, do question. you guys have any questions? Yeah, what questions? Yeah, do you guys so have? Uh, when we were doing our whiteboard brief activity, uh, it came up. Some of our coaches got into some rough scaling options in the whiteboard brief and some coaches uh, didn't provide necessarily any specific scaling options, but kind of painted an outline for scaling. What are your thoughts there? Jay, what do you think? Could you explain that a little bit better, Yanni? Um, so, you know, for example, I think I did 
I did Isabel. Isabel was my uh, whiteboard brief that I did. I didn't, I didn't necessarily include any scaling options for, you know, let's say you have a, you know, an injured shoulder. So maybe you're doing this with dumbbells or, you know, your back's hurting. So maybe you're doing this from the hang or from blocks or something like that. So I, I'm just curious if that's, if the whiteboard is, is the, or if the whiteboard brief is the right place to present some of those specific scaling options, or are you simply trying to explain the intent of the workout, the stimulus, and then kind of take it from there and actually do the majority of the scaling within your kind of progressions, movement, movement prep, that sort of thing? I think that goes back to a lot of what Fern said earlier, where it's like, you know, it depends on the coach and it depends on the athletes. Yeah. If if you coach the same class regularly and you know, you know, Susie's got a bum shoulder, maybe you do talk about it at the whiteboard, but also maybe you're just like, Hey Susie, you're going to go one arm. You're going to do a dumbbell. I think more importantly, the whiteboard brief should be the stimulus first and foremost from there. We can talk about injuries, but it doesn't, you know, you have an eight person class and there, you know, that none of them have any, injuries it doesn't make sense to dive into that rabbit hole mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know if you're trying to lead the most um robust whiteboard brief ever in five minutes and impress people sure you might say something there but i don't think it, it wouldn't it would be unnecessary unless you knew somebody needed those options gotcha probably also workout dependent too right yeah, I mean, the snatch, I mean, you're talking Isabel, it's like, hey, we're doing one movement. So, yeah. you know, now granted, there's a lot of injuries that that can impact from shoulders to legs to low back, like you mentioned. But, you know, when you're running through fil filthy 50s and there's 10 movements, now maybe you need to drop a few of those scaling options because it's probably going to impact more people. Yeah. It also doesn't need to be... Um all-inclusive yeah. right so i'm a big fan of like okay these are the movements like i'm going to give one to two scaling options per movement and not necessarily because i have to but think about it from the athlete standpoint if i do put those out there i'm setting them at ease because what, what i really want is like think about like the, how this unfolds in an actual 60 minute class right it's just like hey guys for isabel it's 30 ground to overhead uh, typically we're going to use a snatch for that. I would throw something like real quick in there. If we need to hang snatch, we can power snatch. Obviously if for whatever reason we can't go overhead, we can use dumbbells and we can do a single arm dumbbell snatch. Okay. If we can't go overhead at all, maybe we just turn it into like maybe a little bit lighter load and we do power cleans, something like that. So it doesn't need to be like this, like, like Jay said, like you don't have to cover everything, but kind of set them at ease to be like, Hey, listen, I've got you covered. Because if you don't cover at least to some degree what the scaling options are, they're not going to pay attention because they're worried about what the hell they're going to do. So I do have to take into account the athlete psyche here because like what's important is that they're paying attention to me. So what I need to do is put them in. He's like, I got you covered. And I generally like to end all of mine with like, so I go, what's the workout? What's the stimulus? What's the uh, scaling options? And I'll just say, if you've got anything else that we need to scale, get with me as we get to the movement and I'll get you sorted out. And now they're paying attention. They're like, okay, he's thinking about me. I'm good. I'll pay attention and have a good time now. So it's, it's not, not necessarily to show that you have all this thing. It's to put them at ease. Yeah. Is what I've found it to really be for. Right. And like, I got you covered. Don't worry about it. Awesome. I, I have another question, but I don't know if anyone else wants to ask anything or, No. I have a question. Would you say that a good whiteboard brief is maintaining a balance between ensuring your athletes trust, trust you to do exactly what you tell them to do when you want to tell them something very specific and also empowering them to like know and trust themselves? Yeah, I think I th it. if I understand the question, it's like you can't baby them. Right. You know, they, they definitely need to learn a little. And, and, you know, going back to original the original question about the stimulus, it's like there's a time and a place where you need to let 
the dude at your box that tries to go RX, go RX on Fran and take 12 minutes and laugh at him. Yeah. And point out that he's dumb and did a bad job today. Like, if you don't do that once in a while, they're never going to learn. It's like kids, yeah. right? But, and you have to let Susie sometimes go light and be done with the heavy day in four minutes. But it's also our jobs after to explain what went wrong. Like, yeah. hey, you took 12 minutes for Frank. Congrats. You did it RX. There is something positive there. However, next time we do this, I need you under five minutes. Here's how we're going to get there. You're going to do 75 pounds, you know, or, you know, Susie, you have to go heavier than this because you're not going to get stronger. You're never going to, you know, and, and perhaps she doesn't want to, but that's also just your opportunity to talk to people and get to know them. And yeah, you, you always have to be educating, but if we, if you're always telling them exactly what to do, they'll never learn. Right. Yeah. I think, I think a good strategy can be kind of like kind of what we did with Brandon. Like it's just, ask him what they're thinking about. Like, like for instance, like I know Brian spent a significant amount of time weightlifting. I know he's competed, uh, you know, in multiple meets nationally and stuff like that. So like, that's where Brian can really like layer in and get some equity and just be like, Hey, listen, like particularly on something like Isabel, be like, Hey, what are you thinking and about using for weight? And they're like 135 all day. And you're like, and Brian's like, listen, man, I know that your max is 140. So maybe 97.8% is not appropriate for 30 reps per time, right. you know? So it's, 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 it's appropriate to like get some input right. from them occasionally. And I generally like to reserve that for my people who've been around a while. There are the people who are new where I'm just like, I'm going to make the decision for you. You're going to put 65 pounds in the bar and then we're moving on. Yeah. Cause you, like you don't want to do that for everybody because that does eat, start eating into my timeline. And if, I'm gonna, if I'm going to have that conversation with every single athlete, I'm going to have that conversation with my athletes that I know are on the cusp. Right. right? They're like, eh. right. But my newer athletes, I'm like, you're going to use an empty bar today. You're going to do a hang snatch. And they're like, got it coach. Cause they're like, I still don't know what the fuck a snatch is anyway. So <laughs> yeah, that's what I'll do. Right. Yeah. And, but, and I think So you have to kind of pick and choose who those athletes you're going to kind of play around with and like, See what they're thinking about and they're you know and, and then maybe guide them a little bit or challenge them like jason and be like hey listen no i want you to go you know 80 pounds today because you really like the 75 pound bar so let's bump it up five and see what happens yeah uh, and i would look at it from this perspective like your whiteboard it's like the 80 20 principle the whiteboard brief should cover 80 percent of your member of your class maybe even more you know maybe all but two people and and then like Brandon said, you're doing the, the wad buildup or whatever you guys call it. That's your opportunity to watch. And also their opportunity to be like, okay, I'm making, I made a mistake. I need to go lighter. I need to do less reps, whatever the workout is. But the whiteboard brief should set most people up for success. I mean, in, in, in Fern's example on Isabel, if, if you say, hey, this needs to be done in under five minutes, if the guy that has a 140 snatch is not smart enough, there's only so much you can do with that person. I mean, without telling, like, he's just dumb. Like, that's like, you guys have dumb members, right? You guys, uh, right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we all, yeah. I mean, you have the same members at Fernhound that I had. Like, we all know those people. And, but then again, then the challenge, I mean, and this can go on really forever. It's like, okay, well, how do you take that guy that really wants to go RX and get him to go 95? You know, and there's some scenarios where it's like, cool, we're going to watch you for the next 18 minutes finish this RX. Yeah. Some days. Then other days, hey, I need you to go 95 and I need you to go unbroken. I don't care what's happening. You need to hold on to your thumb until it rips off. You need to hit all. And then they'll feel the difference on those different days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and there's. And the reason of me like asking that, or at least like framing it in that way is I think it, there's an element of um, like knowing your people and like having soft skills and like, emo like a higher degree of emotional intelligence that like should be expected out of us as coaches because we are leaving people for an hour of their time every day. And so like it is providing more value to our members by like making sure that like we're expecting like a higher degree of emotional intelligence, intelligence of ourselves for other people that we're leading. So that's why I asked that question. And that, yeah, because you could rabbit hole it 
I mean, we could be here for another two hours and still be talking about the same thing. And so, I mean, I think that's probably the, if not the most important thing, one of like looking at all of you guys, I don't, sure, maybe Fern and I can see some movement a tiny bit better than you guys, but I think primarily why Fern and I have gotten where we are as a coach is exactly what you said, Brittany. It's just emotional intelligence. I know the dudes at the box and I'm like, you're dumb. Like, no, <laughs> Nick, you can't do that weight. Like, but I can't, I know the people that I can't say that to also. Yeah. And you have to figure out how you manage all of that. How do I, how do I basically tell this guy he's not strong enough to go RX when his buddy is? Yeah. That's yeah. tough. It's hard. And you each have to do it very differently because you each have very different personalities also. And you also have very different relationships with each of your members. Like right. you think you can immediately think of your members and you're like, I can tell them anything I want because they respect me and because we have that relationship. But you yeah. also know there's a member that if you said it that same way, they're going to reach out to Jack or Yanni and be like, I hate Brittany. Yep. Fire her. <laughs> Because someone did it in my foundation's block. Yeah. Uh, and, but, and, and you may have said the same exact thing in the same exact tone to that person. I think, I mean, Fern laughs at me because I always tell him I'm studying while we're in quarantine and lockdown. But I mean, I'm not studying like history. Like I'm trying to study like that type of stuff. And if you want to take your coaching to the next level and just, you're, I mean, I mean, I don't want to be preachy right now, but if you want to take your life to the next level, like you have to learn how to interact with people. Yes. That's what coaching is. Like, yes, Fern and I can spot hip extension probably a little faster than you guys. That's yep. not why CrossFit Rife is successful. That's not why Fern's on seminar staff. He's yeah. on seminar staff, A, because he's a hard worker and took feedback yeah. primarily, but B, because... I don't think anyone is worried that Fern's going to offend somebody. Yeah. I'm, I don't know. Jay will offend. Jay will offend people. Though. No, I mean, I'll give you a great example of me. There's <laughs> no, two really kidding. good examples, but one of them, Chuck Carswell says it to me all the time. He's like, he's like, you say things to people that you can't say to people. And I'm just like, I don't know. Like I'm just, and I think, I, I, I honestly think it just comes down to like, I'm never trying to come at somebody from the, a bad perspective or not for the right reasons. And I think they pick up on that. And, and I've also gotten to the point where I just leave you, like I had a woman at a level two, I forget it, recently. And she was like, she didn't do her level three. She had interned on staff and it didn't go well years ago. So she's back taking her level two. And she's coaching and it was like the worst experience ever. And I, like, it was like eight minutes into her deadlift and I think they've done one rep. And I forget her name, but I was just like, Hey, can I, let me, and I interrupt and I give feedback and she's like, okay. And then she goes back, back to what she was doing. I give her more feedback and then she just <laughs> lost it. And I'm like, you don't want to learn. Like you, you need to, be able to accept this feedback. Like this is why you probably didn't make staff. Like you, you just think you're right. And it was just like, you have to be able to approach people and tell them that type of stuff, but, but tell them in a way that shows them like, Hey, I care. Like I'm trying to help you. You're not listening to me, but I'm trying to help you. Yeah. It's, it's very, it's like it's empathetic coaching in a way. Like yeah. Being and I think you have to like, just as coaches, we all have to leave our ego aside that's probably the most important thing yeah and Britt, there's actually an episode on empathy i think what is it like number eight or nine or something like that yeah number nine you uh, know what episode no I, I was joking i was like i don't think it's number nine dude <laughs> it's not number nine come on brandon actually, come on you should know this I'm trying to get a shout out yeah brandon which one is it all right i have a question i get berated i get asked a question all right so um in the stimulus episode episode four um you said like yeah, three big ticket items regarding scaling which is load time and reps okay um you guys have mentioned stuff you know a lot of different stuff that i've taken to heart before such as all right before you even think you're a better coach you better know the nine foundational movements and and every point of performance and you know the different 
little a acronyms that you've created to help remember them and stuff like that. So for scaling though, I feel like um, I struggle with, you know, I know I can look at the workout ahead of time, obviously, and, and, I, and I get ready and I prepare and everything. What kind of tips and tricks did you guys do when you kind of, when you first started out to kind of help you come up with our remember scaling options and how to help create the best stimulus for the athlete. So was it like after workouts, did you like write stuff down or take notes? Um, was there different things that you're like, or did you just, you just remember it from just so much experience? I'm, I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to get you guys to tell me a way that you have done something that has helped you along the way with the stimulus, the scaling, the load, the reps, that type of thing. Uh, I want to be able to answer the question correctly. So are you asking like what kind of tricks we use to deliver the information or to understand it? Not necessarily deliver or understand it. Just, just to have the information to be able to present it. So I'm trying to think of a workout that would be an example. Um, or you guys gave an example. It's like, Hey, um, Everybody can run a 400. I'm not going to just throw you on a row or you have two legs that work. So we're going to have you run in place or do shuttle runs or something. It's like stuff like that. I'm like, well, I've never even thought about that. Um, Cause we always put someone on a row or I put someone on a stop bike or they're like, I want to do the ski or um, just different things like that is, do you like keep a journal and you write this stuff in it? It's like, you guys have so much information just flowing around and I'm like, Oh God. All right. She, that's not working for her. That's not going to work for her. Well, let's try this. I think, um, I, I could probably speak for both of us. A, we have a lot of other people's information, right? So like we stole the vast majority of it. So it's a combination of like, we've been doing CrossFit a long time and have had to do many of these things for ourselves, but then I've learned from somebody and I steal and I still still steal from other people on a regular basis. So I'm like, I mean, when we did the box tour, I, I was like, I was like, I don't know why I don't ever do that. Like we should do that as a scale for overhead squats with the rubber bands. I think we're at 12 stage or something like that. I'm like, why don't I ever do that? So some of it is experience, but it's like, I, a, good advice wouldn't be just like, wait till you get experience. You know, it's just like, use, use your own experience. Like as an athlete, be like, if I had to change this, what would I do? Right. And now the easy go to is like, I can't lift that much weight, reduce it. I can't do that many reps, reduce it. I don't run or row or ski or bike that fast. I need to shorten up the time frame. Okay. Then after that, like, it's just a quick go to of like, are they injured? What would I do if I was injured? You know, like I'd use one arm or one leg or I'd take out the half of the movement, only work the upper body or the lower body. So I don't, I don't necessarily think you need this vast box or sea of experience I think some of it is just I have no doubt they called you doctor I don't know if you're actually a doctor but let's just say you are yeah so um I have no doubt that if you just thought about it and put a little bit of time and effort to be like what would I do if this person walked in the door that you would come up with something that was reasonable right so uh, this is going to sound ridiculous but like a lot of people ask questions and I'm like you just haven't thought about it enough like if I just force you in the in the front in in the in front of this group to come up with an option for scaling options for uh, 12 different things, you would probably come up with 12 different options. You know, and I, we both done that at level two is I've seen him do it. And I know I do it. I just let people sit in their own thoughts until they come up with an answer. Hey, what would you do right now? And they're like, mm. and I'm like, I'm not going to give you the answer. Like you need to think about it. Okay. And then, so it, it's one of those things just like, Hey, what would I do? Or what's my experience with this? But then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to default to like, hey, what's the low hanging fruit here? Load, reps, time, injury. Right? Like those are the four. Like just boom. I can knock out 80% like Jay said of like the scenarios that are going to unfold in a gym with those four options. Load, reps, time, injury. And then after that, then I might need to get creative. You know, like does rowing mimic running? No, but biking does a little bit more. I'm moving both my arms and my legs. So, you know, you can do stuff like that. Um, I, did, I, did that answer the question? Yeah, no, it did. It did. did, just... it did. Um, it's, okay. it's helpful. I mean, I, I think sometimes you're like, oh, I just want to sit down and read a book about scaling. Um, that probably doesn't <laughs> exist. But you just put that on the put that on the to-do list. Yeah, it's not the best hour of their day, so I just threw it to the side. <laughs> yeah. 
I think, I mean, everything <laughs> Fern said, I mean, 90% of it is probably experience and we've learned from people. We've been lucky that we see a lot smarter people than us and just, we've been to hundreds of boxes. You know, you guys have probably been to one to five, you know, we've been to a lot of boxes. We've seen some good coaches. And I also think it's, you know, we, we had a lot of opportunity in, you, you guys read the book Outliers? Mm -hmm. You guys read that book, Malcolm Gladwell? There's like, you know, people like the Beatles and they're like, oh, the Beatles were so good all of a sudden. It's like, no, they sucked in Germany for like five years before anyone heard of them. Like, luckily, Fern and I started our boxes early enough where we were giving out rhabdo and hurting people for two or three years before it was, you know, we realized, hey, this is dumb. You know, and then we also, we didn't know any better. I told this story a lot of times, but at my first level one, I literally thought I was going to be the first one done with Fran at like eight minutes. I was like, guys, why come gather around, like get ready. <laughs> it was like, like I didn't know any better until Joe DeGain, who I didn't realize it was Joe DeGain at the time, was on. He, I was like, oh, that dude's quitting. He's literally quitting during this workout. Went through my head. He was done at like three minutes. And I was like, you know, but, so, but my point is we didn't know that. That's when I learned. I was like, oh, shit, you're supposed to do this unbroken? Like, you're supposed to move that fast? You know, so that's the same, like, it's the same thing Fern said. It just came from experience and then lots of mistakes and, and practicing. Yeah. Practicing. I, no, you know, I, no, I, I no, Brandon, you have the, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, like, I don't remember who I heard it from at probably a level one or two where I was like, oh, I could do sh I, shuttle runs is a great example. Like, I never would have thought that. You know, hey, we're doing 400 meter run. It would have very quickly become do 200 which still might not hit the right time, right, you know, for that person versus like, hey, you're going to shuttle run for two minutes because that's how long this should take. Keep this in your back pocket, Brandon. And this is for everybody. It's okay to not know. It's also okay to tell your members that you don't know. It's like, listen, I don't know if this is going to be an appropriate scale. I've never done this before, but I want to try it out and I would love your feedback. And then it'll be like, okay, cool. At least you're trying. Sure. You know what I mean? Right. Be like, listen, like, I'll just be like, listen, I have no fucking idea this is going to unfold, but I'm going to watch. And if it, if this explodes very quickly, then we'll, we'll reassess and we'll change it. But uh, there, there is, there is a lot to be gained by saying, I don't know. And that equity that you'll get with members, that honesty that you're expressing to them goes a long way. Like, I don't know, but just trust that I'm going to take care of you in the process of like this experiment that we're conducting. So it, it's okay to say that. And then circle back with them and be like, hey, what'd you think? Was that appropriate? Like, do we think we could have changed it a little bit more? And then they'll give you, so a lot of it has to do with like working with those people that do have issues rather than always gravitating to the athlete that like has it dialed in and like is really good. It's like, seek out the people that really struggle. Seek out the, you know, the, the underserved population, the people that are overweight, the people that are injured, like uh, work with those people. If you, I mean, if you really wanna get good at scaling, Go work with people that need scaling. You know, we, he, Jay and I have, have, have talked to numerous people that have been out to um, San Jose to HQ and, that are working with the underserved population with Michelle Moots out there. They're serving out there. And we're talking about people that have been on seminar staff for five plus years that have gone to work with this population that is largely 70 plus years old and morbidly obese and all that stuff and have gone there to work with these people and said, holy shit, like I was not prepared for the amount of scaling that needed to be done for this population. So you're gonna need to seek those people out to learn those things and just like, okay, well, we're gonna have to design something really off the wall here that doesn't look anything like that. And you're only gonna have that experience by seeking those people out. Um, and realistically, like those are the people that we wanna help anyway. Because if you can help those people, man, Everything, everything else is a joke. Yeah, we, we have a really diverse group of members at the gym. I mean, from all different skill levels, ages, I mean, body types, everything. So, I mean, those members walk through our door every day. I mean, I can think of, I just thought of like five to 10 different ones in my head. Yeah. So, I mean, you, I, you get opportunities to work with those people every day. 
So uh, it's about an hour 20 in. I don't want to um, abuse anyone's time too much. I, I guess my, I don't know if this is a good way to end it, but I have sort of like a statement slash question. Something that resonated with me in the episode about scaling was, I think Fern, you said, you know, don't beat around the bush. Like if you can take a class of 18 people through Amanda, which is squat snatches and ring muscle ups and provide them all with really good scaling options to get them all to hit the stimulus. That's a really, really hard thing to do. And I think this goes back to what Jack always says, like it's easy to, it's easy to coach CrossFit at a mediocre level. It's really hard to coach CrossFit at a high level. And so I guess my, the question that comes to me from that is how do you guys, you know, Fern and, and, and Ackerman, how do you guys judge success for yourselves as a coach, whether that's on a daily basis or weekly basis, like what are, what are the questions that you're asking yourself given how hard this stuff is? I mean, it's not, it's not easy. Yeah. I'll take that one, let one step further. So our whole goal at the gym, I mean, we, we've grown at a, a aggressive rate. I mean, I think we would, by the number of members that we've had, things like that. How do you go from good to great? I think that's the hardest step for any business or any athlete or anybody is saying, okay, we're really good, but how do we go to great? And we believe that is through our coaches and we believe that's through our member experience. So I'll expand on what Jan just said. So I, um, I, I'll go ahead. You go first. You're fine. Okay. Um, as, as Fern was talking last time, about some of the things I was thinking is I think, you know, the seminar staff is probably the, maybe not unanimously the best coaches in the world, but they're certainly up there. And, and as a, as a whole, certainly, you know, the best conglomerate of coaches. And I think I was kind of trying to think what separates them. And I think there's probably about 150 to 200 right now on staff. And I'd say, especially the ones that came up when Fern and I were and, and prior to that, all do the th these three things very well. And, and Fern was alluding to them, but they have the willingness to say, I don't know. They have the willingness to ask for help and they have the willingness to accept feedback. And I think that's how we got better as, as coaches. I mean, I went through 10 internships. That's like, a ton of feedback. And if you're not willing to get feedback and, and I should probably add to that, implement that feedback, you, you know, you're, you're never going to get better as a coach. Um, to, to maybe to answer more directly, like how would I measure it? I know it's like cliche and, and cheesy and I don't, it's not really um, measurable, but it's like, I truly look at people and try to think after I coach them, was that the best hour of their day? And, you know, it's, it's not, you know, it's hard to quantify, but that's really when you say like, did I do a good job? Sure. It's nice when somebody gets their first muscle up or hits a PR, which usually leads to them having the best hour of their day. But going back to what we spoke about with Brittany, it's like, you have to know what that means for different people. You know, for example, I, I use this example a lot, but you know, for men and women, like, I don't know what the percentage is, but I'd say, a high percentage of people are in un unhappy relationships. It's like pretty high percentage, right? Maybe not pretty high, but a, a decent amount. I feel like this you're projecting like right now. <laughs> <laughs> Ross just left. I can say whatever I want. Um, mm -hmm. No, I mean, but you have to remember that. Like they don't go home to the best hour of their day. This is it. And we have to like give that to them. And that doesn't mean we push them. Like for for some days, I mean, I remember it. Like, that's how important it was. This woman, Sarah, who's married, her husband came in, her kids came in. They had a great relationship. But one day she looked at me and she was like, you always make me feel so special. And I wasn't doing anything weird. Like, I just was coaching her and, like, was telling her, like, that was great. Like, you did a good job. She probably did two toes to butt in a row. Like, like, that's what you have to be doing. And, like, it's hard to measure that. But... I also think you guys all know that when you see it. Mm -hmm. So my challenge to you would be like, can you get that smile from every person in your room? You know, and then I had somebody else in the same class, Nick, entrepreneur, firefighter, like, you know, stud dude. 
he didn't need me to give him praise, but when I got him his first muscle up, I still hear about it, you know, two years later. So you have to know that about those people. But I don't know how to, if you're looking for a way to measure that, I don't know. But what I would I, tell you is you can watch your, you know, each other's classes and, and start to help people see it also. Like that was it. Like when Leslie's coaching and if you watch Jan and you're like, Leslie, you did it. Like now she kind of knows what that means. Yeah, I like that. It all goes back to people don't care what you know until they know you care every, every time. I tell you yeah, this, like, but, I'm a really bad, sorry for last thing. I, was, I still don't feel like I'm a great coach from a movement perspective. Not only, to be fully honest, I don't really love it. Like, that doesn't get me excited. Like, what gets me excited is I know that's how I get to you for the other stuff. You know, but I don't care if you get your – are you watching a football game, Brittany, or did I say something different? <laughs> You guys have been saying things that like really resonate with me and I feel like I like get so like fucking stoked about this stuff when we have our staff meetings and I look like an idiot sometimes because I'm well, so excited about it. I can't it. say whether or not you look like an idiot, Brittany. Ah. <laughs> I, but I'm saying like... Brandon Pete himself. Fern, Fern will always be like, hey, we need to do an episode on movement. And like, I'll do them and I don't even think I've ever said it to him, but it's like, I don't, that doesn't really get me that excited. Like, Turns out those are the episodes that a lot of people like listening to. But to me, it's more like this stuff. The problem is we don't know how to quantify it. You know, we don't know how to measure it. But I think we do deep down. It's just hard to get other people to do that. But I can tell you, I mean, first of all, there's what, you know, 10 or 11 of you guys here. Granted, you don't have much else to do. But, you know, you're here for, because you care about people, which is the biggest and best first step, you know. But remembering... Yeah. It's hard to, E.C. Sinkowski once, you know, said to me, she's like, you know, I, I forget what I asked, like, how do you bring it or whatever to seminar? She's like, I look at these 10 people and I'm like, they each spent a thousand dollars. They each took their weekend. They left other things because they want to be here. So it doesn't matter if I'm tired. It doesn't matter what's going on in my life. I need to bring it for this hour. And it's a little selfish too, because I know you all feel better after you do it for the hour for them. Yeah. All right, one last thing. Well, um, did Fern, do you... Go ahead. No, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that requires any addition. Mic drop? Um, Shut my computer? Is that like... Yeah, I, don't know about that. I don't know about that. I just say I'm not going to add anything. You know, I'll you take my earbud out, throw it. <laughs> um, thank you guys very much. Will you... Uh, so I'm going to sign up for Mastermind just because you guys took the time to do this. Will you give us a little plug for Mastermind and tell us what it is? And then will you tell us a little bit about your programming um, and why it's better than Ham Plan and Bergeron? I'll let Bird answer all this. <laughs> yeah. So Do you guys write it? We're, like, yeah. So okay. the mastermind is I uh, will. Uh, we're in the process of revamping that, but the whole goal of that was to be think of it like ACT prep. And what we want to do is bring people in and prep them for the level three. Like we we want to push everybody as far through that funnel. <laughs> of CrossFit as humanly possible because we just want people to pursue knowledge, right? Like, I, I think if you're not chasing, like, just being better at your craft, then I think, I think quite frankly, I think you should find something else to do, okay? Um, so that's all it is. Like, we have, we have topics that we discussed. Like, today, I basically discussed uh, the technique lecture, and we went through it and let people ask questions, and we, and we talked about, like, how to execute that on a daily basis. The programming... We actually don't write it anymore. So uh, I'll, and I'll, I'll let you guys into why we do that. So um, I have never. That chappy? It is. Oh my goodness. Um, Has he been doing it this whole time? Just like, no, not you? the whole time. I keep him under oh, a desk. Yeah. Him under your desk. <laughs> I was like, he's been pretty quiet for now. No, he, he, he just came in a minute ago. Um, no, he, uh, so we don't write it anymore. The reason we started writing programming is not because either one of us uh, like writing programming. Like I'm passionate about programming, but um, we wrote programming because it was going to be a vehicle for what we eventually want to do, which is basically develop coach content that is video based, right? So, and I'll let you guys in on the secret, right? The, the hard part about doing all that is like, what are we, get, what's the topic we're going to cover today? Like, and then creating this content moving forward. So, um, the easy way to get a content calendar is like just pull the content off of the lesson plans. So that's why we started writing lesson plans and offer the programming because I wanted to use that as a vehicle to create content. 
turns out that takes a shitload of time. If you're going to write like really good lesson plans that people can execute that are realistic, like it takes a long time. Um, so we pushed that over to cam plan because I trust James and Austin and Spencer. And I think they have a really good product that is just, I, they're better at it than we are just straight up. I don't have any problem saying that. Um, because what I want to do is create content that is like this for you guys to consume at your leisure which is a good coach like Jay or somebody else who's on the floor, like walking you through all of these things so that you can consume it five to 10 minutes a day. That's what I'm passionate about, right? Like programming's cool, but like after a while, I just want to bang my head on a desk and walk out in heavy traffic. So it is what it is. <clears throat> um, so we're not writing the programming anymore um, so that we can refocus and move it that way. Cause like Jay and I were passionate about this right here not about writing sexy rep schemes. Um, I think that stuff is valuable, but this is where, this is kind of like what fills my cup as far as just like what gets me jazzed up. And like what Brittany said, just like get fucking stoked. Um, like this is what gets me fired up. So that's what we're going to redirect our efforts to um, because that's where I think like, that's what people want to see. That's what I think that we both happen to be good at now. And it's fun. So hopefully we're going to launch that by um, August. Uh, if not, maybe a little bit sooner, but it'll be basically um, coach content, roughly five days a week, five to 10 minutes a piece, just all the nerdy stuff that you would ever want to see um, within a coach. So, Awesome. That sounds amazing. Yeah. I just want to well, thank you guys again. I mean, this has been indispensable for us. I mean, we're a young gym. We're about two and a half years old. We're, uh, you know, figuring out quickly that retention is really what everything comes down to for us. And I think, you know, what, at the end of the day, what we've been talking about is retention, right? I mean, quality of coaching leads to retention and caring about people leads to retention. Yeah. Um, I guess if you wanted to quantify all the things that you talked about Ackerman, I think retention is how you quantify it. Right. Yeah. I think that's, you know, or at least I think of at, retention as one way to quantify it. But certainly, you know, hard to do on a per class basis. But yeah, if you're, you know, it's like Coach Glassman said, if if the box down the street is taking your members, it's probably because they're having more fun. That's a great way to end it, isn't it? I was typing something. I'm going to hit enter. I want to shoot you guys. If you guys don't already have a copy. Email that email that I just sent out and I'll send you guys a copy. Not sure if you knew I wrote a book, Vern, but I wrote a book. I didn't. I'll right, man. It up. I'm sure there's plenty of copies left over. <laughs> they're, they're PDFs, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, y'all. Uh, Thank you guys enough. We, this we really good. hope, like, the big thing for us is, like, we hope this was valuable. So we hope we actually, like, didn't waste anybody's time and you guys took something away from this. Um, and if, if, if you didn't find it valuable, please let us know because um, that's important to us. No, thank you. I, I think for y'all to spend the time is, is pretty – it says a lot. It really says a lot. Yep. Chappie's coming back in for – that's what I do now. All right. <laughs> I do have to – I think I laughed for like 10 minutes after Fern told that person not to use four ab mats. Like, why are you? Quarter inch range of motion. I did, yeah. I did. Uh, and I know that person, I know that member's like, you have five ab mats. What are you doing? Like, well, yeah, we're doing. Put them right here. Yep. Hi, y'all. It's eight o'clock. We appreciate your time, everybody. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you, guys. Let us know if you can get Yeah, reach out if you guys ever need anything. Absolutely. Thank you all very much. Hey Pleasure. Yeah.